here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. In this episode, we focus on dividend stocks and ETFs. And we know that dividend-paying stocks are always popular with investors because investors love that steady stream of income and also the stability that these stocks provide to a portfolio. This year, dividend stocks and ETFs have seen even more than usual interest uh, because in the current market environment of rising rates and inflation, uh, these dividend stocks look better positioned than bonds since they may grow their payouts and also realize capital appreciation. And these also provide uh, some inflation protection over the long term. Uh, these stocks, dividend paying stocks, also weather market downturns better than others. Uh, so that is why this year in income focused investors have started relying a lot on dividend paying stocks. Now, there are two popular approaches to dividends dividend investing, dividend growth stocks, and high dividend stocks. So, dividend growth stocks are usually high quality companies with solid balance sheets and stable cash flows. And these have generally outperformed the broader market over the long term. This year, however, high dividend payers have done much better than dividend growers because these are typically in defensive areas of the market, utilities, real estate, consumer staples, many Oil companies, energy companies have also boosted their payouts uh, recently in the recent months. So they are among the top holdings in high dividend funds, and they are also uh, responsible for excellent performance by um, high dividend ETFs. My guest today is Anu Ganti, Senior Director, Index Investment Strategy at S&P Dow Jones Indices. Anu and I will talk about the basics of dividend investing. And S&P Dow Jones offers many dividend indices which measure the performance of uh, dividend growth strategies as well as high yield dividend strategies. So we'll talk about both those strategies and also whether combining those two strategies makes sense. And then I will talk about some of the popular ETFs that investors could consider uh, to track uh, those indices. Joining me now is Anu Ganti. Anu, welcome. Great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Nina. It's nice to be here. So let's talk about dividend stocks and ETFs that have gathered billions of dollars this year. Tell us why dividend stocks are so popular this year. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, we're in a very interesting environment right now, and there's a couple of key macro factors at play. So a couple of things to highlight is we've seen rising inflation throughout the year, particularly rising core inflation. We're also seeing that the markets are expecting tighter Fed policy. And as a result, equities have suffered. So if you think about all these different factors playing out in the market right now and with equity suffering, dividend yield comes to top of mind. And it's a very typical defensive factor. And I would say it's very relevant in today's environment of rising rates and inflation and higher volatility. And at S&P, we like to think of it dividends as, as the two P's. And the, and the two P's are protection and participation. So dividends can act as a cushion during down markets and they can also capture upside potential. So you've got the two Ps going. And as an example for you, the, the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats historically have outperformed you know, in momentous times in history, for example, during the tech bubble and the great financial crisis. So dividend growers are, are especially very relevant right now. 
Very interesting. And uh, talking about dividend growth, um, I know that you at S&P Dow Jones track dividend payouts by U.S. companies. So could you tell us how many companies have raised dividends this year? And you mentioned uh, rising inflation and uh, the monetary policy tightening. Mm -hmm. So do you think those trends of uh, dividend raises can continue going forward because we know that the economy is slowing down and that will impact uh, companies' earnings. So talk to about talk to us about the trends this year and whether right. those trends can continue. Right. So so a couple of key stats for you. One is year to date as of September, we've seen a total of 274 positive announcements in the S&P 500. So for 2022, dividend payments are expected to increase in excess of 10 percent. And if that happens, that would set a new annual record payment and it would also outpace inflation. So so the working view for dividends is positive. But as I mentioned, you know, the unknowns are at play, right, of whether future inflation continues to rise, whether the Fed will continue to tighten rates and whether we continue to see slowing economic growth. So it'll be contingent upon all those factors that we talked about. So let's take a step back and talk about the importance of dividends, mm -hmm. the basics of dividends uh, investing. So tell us about the role of dividend stock in an investor's portfolio and how have these dividend strategies uh, uh, benefited investors portfolios absolutely so dividends are very important and and it's important to look at it in the context of history if you go back a couple of decades so dividends have increasingly been more important to households and if you think about it dividends as a share of personal income have climbed significantly from going back a couple of decades to say 1981 to now. And meanwhile, on the other side of the spectrum, you have interest income as a share of personal income, and that has declined significantly over the past couple of decades, which makes sense given the decline in bond yields that we've seen historically. And another trend that we've seen historically is that the S&P 500's dividend growth has outpaced inflation since 2000. And we'll see if that trend continues. So these are a couple of statistics that really show the importance of dividends. And another point that, that I'd like to highlight is dividends contribution to total return. So to, to give you another statistic, a significant portion of long-term total return can be attributed to dividends. So going back to 1936, dividends have contributed roughly a third to equity return, which, which is very powerful. Very interesting. Uh, so companies have limited uses of their cash flows that they generate, and some companies just prefer to reinvest all of their cash flows for organic growth or for uh, acquisitions. Uh, these are more growth here companies, some of the most important companies in the world like Facebook, Amazon, Google, Parent, Alphabet, they haven't paid dividends to shareholders ever. Uh, there are other more mature companies uh, which also generate a lot of cash flows and they prefer to return some of that money to their shareholders via dividends or buybacks. And you talked about uh, trends and dividend payouts uh, this year. And I also read that companies have also bought back their stocks at record pace this year. And when companies uh, buy back their stock, these share repurchases, they generally reduce, they do reduce uh, their shares outstanding. So the EPS generally increases and that uh, improves the share prices in short term. Uh, so can you break down the difference between dividends and share buybacks? How should investors view the two? Sure. So, so it's interesting to look at dividends versus buybacks because they're interrelated, like you talked about. And historically, what we've seen is that with buybacks, companies tend to have more flexibility than with a dividend. And to give you a couple of statistics on the on the buyback side, Q1 was a record for buybacks. And in Q2, we've actually seen it run lower on the buyback side. And that's mainly because of a pullback in the financial sector. And perhaps this could be potentially because of the need to protect uh, the company's dividends within this sector. So there's that interrelationship between dividends 
versus buybacks. And another example for you from a sector perspective is that energy has re-entered the buyback market with buybacks up significantly over Q1 and Q2 of last year. So it's interesting to see these changing dynamics from 2022 compared to 2021. But you're absolutely right that that both of these are interrelated. So going back to dividend stocks, these are very important. They have a very important role in an investor's portfolio and uh, investors love dividend stocks. So tell us how investors should select dividend stocks for their portfolio. Should they look at the dividend yield or the consistency of dividend payment? And we also hear about some dividend traps. Tell us what exactly are dividend traps. Uh, Overall, how should investors evaluate any dividend stock? Right. Now, that's a very good question. And at S&P, we like to think of dividends in terms of two main categories, and those are dividend growth strategies versus dividend yield strategies. So if you break it down and we think about dividend growth, right, we're looking at constituents within an index that consistently increase dividends every year. Now, on the other side, if we're looking at the dividend yield bucket, we're looking at high yield constituents within an index. And a lot of our indices also apply quality screening up upon that, you know, once you have the high yield. So looking at that dividend sustainability criteria. And historically, we've seen that dividend growth strategies comprise companies that tend to be of higher quality. And now to, to your second point on traps, right? It's important to understand that not all yields are created equal. So if you think we go back to basics, a company's dividend yield is calculated as the dividends divided by the company's stock price. And it's possible that a company could earn a high dividend yield simply through price underperformance rather than as a result of growing the dividends. So one example for you from an index perspective is we have our S&P dividend growers indices. And what they do is they attempt to avoid those yield traps by excluding the top 25% of the highest yielding eligible companies. And that's because our research has shown that on average, the highest dividend yielding securities have proven to be yield traps, achieving that status through underperformance. So it's definitely something to look out for. That's very helpful. Now let's talk about uh, some of your indices and uh, let's start with the ones that focus on dividend growth. Uh, so you have a suite of dividend growers and dividend aristocrats. Uh, tell us about those indices, uh, how exactly they weight stocks in, and uh, what kind of stocks they track. Yeah, yeah. So if we look at our suite of indices, as I mentioned, you have the two big categories, right? You know, first, let's start with dividend growth. And we're looking at focusing on increasing dividends. The companies historically have tended to be higher quality than the broad market in terms of earnings quality and leverage. And they tend to be a buffer against market volatility. And to give you a couple of examples, one, one classic example is the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats. And the companies within this index have increased dividends each year for at least 25 years. And what we've seen from a performance perspective is they've outperformed over the long term. And also coupled with that is they outperformed with less volatility. And they tend to be companies with higher quality. And from a yield perspective, they've also had higher yield than the benchmark as well. And the other example that I touched on earlier was the dividend grower series. And we have our S&P US dividend growers index as an example. And here the criteria is looking for companies that have increased dividends for at least 10 years. And then we exclude the top 25% of the highest yielding eligible companies to avoid those yield traps. And then also in the, the aristocrat series, we have the S&P high yield dividend aristocrats index. And here the universe is based on companies within the S&P composite 1500 and looking for companies that have increased their dividends for at least 20 years. So these are various options on the menu from a dividend growth uh, perspective. And now I'd like to turn to the second bucket, which is the, the dividend yield category. So here are a couple of examples for you. One is the S&P 500 high dividend index. And that composes 80 companies, 80 high yield companies within the S&P 500. But the, the example that I wanted to touch on also was the Dow Jones Select Dividend Index. 
And here, what, what this index is doing is it looks for 100 high dividend paying companies. And it's also subject to dividend sustainability criteria. So really looking for that balance between high yield as well as dividend sustainability and criteria including dividend growth, profitability, as well as dividend coverage. So these are a few examples to think about when, when looking at the suite of dividend indices. So talking about the two strategies, uh, so dividend growth strategies, the ones uh, tracked by dividend aristocrat and dividend growers, these are usually high quality companies with very strong balance sheets and they, that's why they continue to raise their dividend payouts year after year after year. Uh, so they tend to outperform. They have generally outperformed the broader indices over the long term. But this year in particular, we know that this year is very different for the markets and uh, high dividend stocks have done much better this year. And one of the reasons is that defensive areas of uh, the market have done better and then energy companies uh, outperformed particularly earlier this year and they are among the high dividend payers. Uh, so, and we do not know what is going to happen going forward, uh, whether uh, later this year, whether high dividend payers are going to outperform or dividend growers are going to outperform. So should investor consider combining these two strategies in their portfolios? Does that make sense? That's an interesting question. And, and when you talk about dividend yield versus dividend growth, one analogy that I'd like to give you is value versus growth, right? If you think about that relationship. So what we've seen is that when growth dominated in the past, the aristocrats outperformed. And now vice versa, if we flip it on its head this year, when we've seen value outperform, dividend yield strategies outperformed. So it's very interesting to, to see that relationship from a factor lens. And, and one other index that, that, you know, that I can talk about is the S&P 500 low volatility uh, high dividend index, which is looking to combine, you know, capture the benefit of high dividend as well as low volatility uh, strategies. So absolutely, it's interesting to think about combining these different strategies. And you can look at it from a return perspective as well as a, a risk perspective. And if we go back to history, we see that the high dividend index has had both higher returns and higher risk than the S&P 500. Now, if we look at the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats, they've had higher returns and less risk than the S&P 500. So there's that low volatility anomaly that we see with the tendency of stocks with low volatility to outperform the market. So now if you put it together and you have a combination of these two, the combination potentially could provide more return for the same level of risk if you think about your efficient frontier, so dominating that efficient frontier. So I think it's important to remember that you don't need to think about these separate different dividend buckets in, in silos, but it's interesting to look at the different pairs and combinations. Excellent stuff, Anu. Thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your insights. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So that was Anu Ganti from S&P Dow Jones. Now let's take a look at some popular ETFs that track the indices that we discussed. The most popular dividend ETF, uh, it is by Vanguard, the Vanguard Dividend Appreciation ETF, ticker symbol VIG. It tracks the performance uh, of the S&P US Dividend Growers Index. Very popular, as I mentioned, it has about 61.8 billion in assets and ultra cheap with just six basis points expense ratio. So this holds companies that have a record of increasing their dividends over time. United Health Group and Microsoft are its top holdings. Uh, then among the dividend growers, we talked about uh, dividend aristocrat indices. And Brocious has a suite of ETFs uh, that track these dividend aristocrats. Uh, the one which tracks the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats index is Noble, ticker symbol N-O-B-L. It holds companies that have grown their dividends for at least 25 consecutive years. Albemarle and Exxon Mobil are among its 
top holdings. Now, if you want to take a look at the high dividend payers, then uh, one with which is very popular is uh, by State Street. Uh, it is the Spider Portfolio S&P 500 High Dividend ETF, take the symbol SPYD. It invests in top 80 high dividend yielding companies from the S&P 500 index. And this is also very cheap with just seven basis points expense ratio. Now, if you are looking for companies with high dividend yields, as well as a history of dividend growth, uh, then the ETF that is worth a look is again by State Street. It is the Spider S&P Dividend ETF, ticker symbol SDY. This holds companies that have consistently increased their dividends for at least 20 consecutive years, and then it weights, uh, weights those stocks by yields. So you get both a high yield as well as uh, a history of dividend growth. Now, another very popular product in the high dividend space is by iShares. It is the iShares Select Dividend ETF, a ticker symbol DVY. It holds 100 US stocks with five-year records of paying dividends. And if you take a look at the holdings, Altria and Valero Energy are among its top holdings. Finally, Anu also talked about the benefits of combining low volatility and high dividend strategies. And the ETF which is worth a look is by Invesco. It is uh, the Invesco S&P 500 high dividend low volatility ETF, the ticker symbol is SPHD. And uh, if you look at the top holdings in this ETF, Kinder Morgan and Altria Group are among the top holdings. So it uh, the ETF basically holds 50 companies that have provided high dividend and also have low volatility. So you combine low volatility and high dividend yield in this ETF. Thanks for listening. If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. And also make sure to subscribe so that you do not miss any episode. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please email podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.